So first of all, thank you all for being here. My name is uh, Jason Silva. I'm the host of the TV show Brain Games on the National Geographic Channel. I'm also the creator of Shots of Awe in partnership with Discovery Digital Networks. And I'm really honored to be here today with you guys and with my very dear friend Stephen Kotler, who is a New York Times best-selling author, brilliant thinker, co-founder of the Flow Genome Project, and just one of my favorite people in the world. And we've been having these mind jams every time we hang out here in New York. We've never recorded it. So we thought, why don't we get together and put this on camera and invite a bunch of people and let's talk about creativity, innovation, flow states, and all that good stuff. So Steven, what's up? Hey Jason, I don't know how I topped that intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just uh, to set up a little bit of context, but to really get things started, I'm gonna ask you to define flow states. This is your specialty. So for those that are not familiar with the concept, even though we keep hearing about it in the press, we keep hearing about it in the media, welcome, welcome, have a seat, yes. Um, but so, uh, flow states are associated with peak human performance, right? It's when we seemingly achieve the impossible. So tell us, what are flow states? So you may know flow by a lot of other synonyms. Runner's high, being in the zone. If you're a basketball player, you call it being unconscious. If you were a beatnik jazz musician, you called it being in the pocket. If you're a stand-up comic, you call it the forever box. Flow is sort of a technical term, and it is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness, a state of consciousness where we perform our best and we feel our best. It refers to those moments of kind of rapt attention at total absorption, where we get so focused on the task at hand that everything else disappears. So your sense of self, your sense of self-consciousness, they vanish completely. Time dilates, which is a fancy way of saying it passes strangely. So sometimes it speeds up, and five hours will go by in like five minutes, and occasionally it slows down, and you'll get that freeze frame effect. Maybe any of you have been in a car crash or seen the matrix, and throughout, all aspects of performance, that's mental and physical, go through the roof. And if you want a quick and dirty definition of it, flow is as close to picture-perfect decision-making as we can possibly get, which is where the state gets its name. In the state of flow, every decision, every action leads seamlessly, fluidly, perfectly to the next. Flow feels flowy. So it's actually a technical term. And it came out of actually one of the largest psychological studies ever done. And when they were interviewing people about it, they kept using this term, flow. So that's where it came from. So I'm obsessed with flow states. I've experienced them regularly. But since I was a little kid, when I got into this wonderfully inspired headspace, everything seemed effortless. But creating a flow state, eliciting a flow state, catalyzing a flow state has always been kind of enigmatic. You know, it's kind of like, peak experience, this haphazard phenomenon that sometimes emerges and sometimes it doesn't. But as a control freak, I've always under, wanted to understand, well, what are the precursors for triggering these ecstatic moments, these highly lucid moments? And for me, it's always been when it comes to writing, when it comes to speaking, when it comes to, as you say, lateral thinking, free association, connecting the dots in a new way. And you guys, I mean, you and Jamie Wheel, part of the Flow Genome Project, have started to really peek beneath the lid, so to speak, right? And figure out what's going on in the brain when we go into these flow states. Now, you guys are saying that, that what I remember reading is the advances in psychology, neurobiology, psychopharmacology, and technology, all these four pillars are advancing so fast that now all of a sudden we get to see what's going on. We get to stop speaking in woo-woo terms and be like, what's happening and how can we reproduce this and how can we benefit from it, right? So tell me about these advances and what you guys are doing in Flow Genome Project. Yeah, we can actually, believe it or not, thank George Bush Sr. for this. Um, 1990 declared it the decade of the brain and money flooded into neuroscience and most of it was spent on neuroimaging technology. So we got really, really good at peering inside the brain and figuring out what's going on. So for the very first time in history, right, we actually are now starting to decode what happens in Flow. And I'll just give you a, a little bit of the neuroscience just so you have some context. Two main things are important. From a neural anatomical level, right? Normally, the old idea of what happened about ultimate performance, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, is the 10% brain myth, the idea that we're only using 10% of our brain, so ultimate performance, aka flow, must be the full brain on overdrive. Turns out we had it exactly backwards. 
inflow parts of the brain are not becoming hyperactive, they're actually deactivating, they're shutting down. The technical term for this is transient, meaning temporary. Hypo, H-Y-P-O, it's the opposite of hyper, it means to slow down, to shut down, to deactivate. Frontality, which refers to the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right back here. Prefrontal cortex is your executive function. It's all of your higher cognitive functions. It's the part that you most associate with you. So your sense of morality, your sense of will, your sense of self, complex decision making. In flow, that portion of the brain shuts down. So why does time pass so strangely in flow? Because time, it turns out, is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. And as parts of it start to wink out, we can no longer separate past from present from future. We're plunged into what's called the deep now. Another thing that happens in the prefrontal cortex, and this is probably the best part, is when the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and this is going to be a quiz later, so I hope you're all taking notes. Um, when this portion of your brain shuts down, it does a lot of things, but one of the most important things it does is it's your inner critic. So that nagging, always on, defeatist voice that's in your head that doesn't shut up, that won't leave you alone, shuts up and flow. So we experience this as profound liberation. We are literally free of ourselves for the first time. As a result, creativity goes up, risk taking goes up, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a combination of five of the most potent neural chemicals the brain can produce. These are all performance enhancing chemicals, but they serve a second function, which is they're all feel good pleasure drugs, right? And just to give you an idea, one of the chemicals that shows up in flow is dopamine, which you guys have probably heard of. Dopamine, well, let's back up. Cocaine is widely considered the most addictive drug on earth, right? All that happens when somebody uses cocaine they is the br dopamine. they get dopamine, right? So you get dopamine, you get endorphins, and just endorphins are opiates, natural version of heroin or morphine, just the one our brain produces is painkillers, but the most common endorphin in the brain is 100 times more powerful than medical morphine. The combination, so first of all, if you wanted to go out onto the street and cocktail the street drug versions of this state, you'd end up dead or in a coma. Would not work, some of the drugs would actually cancel themselves out. Your brain does it perfectly, which means flow is the most addictive state on earth. We will go extraordinarily far out of our way to get more of it, Jason I'm sure will attest. Yeah, well one of the things that's blown my mind about the attention that flow has gotten recently in the media is that it's, 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 it's given it a language, right? It's, it's given us an ability to describe the ineffable ecstasy of being in that zone, being in that pocket, whether it's the jazz musician when he is improvising and he literally transcends himself, the basketball player achieving the impossible, the snowboarder, the elite athletes pushing beyond the limits of the sport. Something is happening in this moment. And I remember there was some science recently where they scanned the brains of rappers and they had them freestyle lyrics, which means you know completely improvised. And then of course they had them recite memorized lyrics. And what they said is exactly that, the lateral pre frontal cortex, the inner critic, the self-editing goes away, or as your partner Jamie Wheel says, your inner Woody Allen, right? That self-crippling self-doubt, that self-consciousness that so often acts as paralysis for us. Like, to be free from that is such ecstasy. And so, what I'm curious about is, how do you, how do you take this and make this mainstream? Because, yes, it is all about, it is all about us getting high and entering these flow states. But then what do we do with these flow states when we say we achieve the impossible? You give it a lot of lectures, corporate talks all over the world because apparently people doing business are like 10 times more productive when they achieve flow. So it's like, can you grab this high that artists are using, that athletes are using and bring it into the workplace and bring it into these new spaces so that we can essentially upgrade society? I mean, this is an ambitious idea, but this is what you guys are doing at Flow Genome, right? It is kind of what we're doing. Um, they're not 10 times. So McKinsey did a 10-year study, and they found top executives in flow are five times more productive. So it's 500% more productive. It means you could go to work on Monday, spend Monday in a flow state, take Tuesday through Friday off, and get as much done as your steady state peers. That's how much of an amplification and performance you're actually talking yeah. about. What we now know is, and it's, it's interesting. So for a really long time, studying flow was was problematic because how did you know if somebody was in a flow state? You had to give them a subjective questionnaire, right? And it's flimsy science and it's extremely well validated questionnaire. There's about 50 years worth of research. But what started happening in the past 25 years is 
for reasons I'll get to in a second, action adventure sport athletes, snowboarders, skiers, surfers, whatnot, they got better at reliably and reproduce, repeatedly reproducing the state of flow than anybody else pretty much in the history of the world. As a result, we've seen near exponential growth in ultimate human performance in action and adventure sports. So incredible things have happened in the past 25 years. More impossible feats have been done than ever before. From a research perspective, they gave us something we've never had before, which is at the upper level of competition these men and women are performing at, if they're not in flow, they're going home in a body bag or they're going to the hospital. So suddenly, our research subjects, if they lived through the experience, we knew they were in flow. And having this as a kind of a, a, a backdrop, a, a data set to work with, has allowed us to work backwards. We now know there are 17 triggers, 17 preconditions that lead to more flow. And we also know there's something called the flow cycle, a four-stage process this state moves through, which is sort of the map of the territory. You combine these things, like we do with the Flow Genome Project, and this isn't, I mean, there's lots of different people out there teaching flow and, and whatnot, but I'll just give you our numbers. Um, we've taught, I don't even know how many people, thousands of people at this point. On average, when people come through our courses, six-week course, by the way, not even a hard course, the homework's a little strange, but um, it's a six-week course. People are reporting a five-fold, so a 500% increase in flow, a 500% increase in creativity, and a 300% increase in self-confidence. And the last one, by the way, self-confidence, we had like it, we had no idea that was going to happen. It was just something that emerged out of the data. We were really shocked by it. Um, but yes, the state is entirely trainable. Yeah. And you know, as we get better at our neuroscience, it's going to get more and more trainable. So eventually we'll get to the point that we can literally be able to press a button and get into our highest state, so to speak. You can do it already. I mean, like, the, so one of the ways they induce flow artificially now is transcranial magnetic stimulation. They literally shoot a big neuromagnetic pulse through the brain. They knock out the prefrontal cortex, inducing artificial flow, kicking people into flow. DARPA did this. They took a group of sn snipers and they trained them up in flow by knocking out the prefrontal cortex. They found they learned 200 to 500 percent faster than normal. They redid the study with novice, non-military archers, riflemen, and pistol shooters, three different categories. They found the time it takes to go from novice to expert can be cut in half by flow. So yes, there is already a button for it. Which is wonderful. So besides it being a wonderfully smart and productive technique to assimilate and to learn, there's also its connection fundamentally to the human condition. You know, Jamie Wheel had a wonderful TEDx talk called, your partner, from altered states to altered traits, and this idea of hacking the flow state. He said, most of us, while we recognize these flow states, we get hooked on the state instead of raising the stage, right? So we go there, but then when we come back into ourselves Monday morning again, and it's like, what the fuck, right? right? And part of the thing that he was talking about is that if you think of our self systems, the way that our homeostasis right now, we're like a colander and we're full of holes. And no matter how much flow we pour in, we're kind of draining. So you have to be constantly pouring it in to achieve any kind of equilibrium. But then he talks about the idea of turning our colander into a chalice so that we could literally make flow the default condition. Now, technology is advancing exponentially. We have new construction kits for our reality. You explored this in abundance and bold and your new book, Tomorrowland. Can you speculate about how we might raise the stage, reverse engineer ourselves, creating a default flow state, you know? It's an interesting question. One thing for sure, we, there's no such thing as a permanent flow state, right? This, Bummer. The, <laughs> the, neuro <laughs> okay. yeah. the neurochemicals that produce flow are in short supply. So once you burn through them, and you can burn through some of them in 20 minutes, dopamine and norepinephrine will burn out of your brain in about 20 minutes. It takes a little while to replenish them. So there's no, we have a lot of people, not a lot of people, occasionally people will come up to me and like, I live in a permanent flow state. I'm like, yeah, we have a word for that. We call it schizophrenia. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? It's, um, so you don't get to live in a permanent flow state. You can cycle through it and you can shorten the distance between cycles very, very quickly. So you can move through it. There's a lot of ninjutsu there. But, I mean, what does it mean for society if the 500% more productivity, if you just, I'm going to throw out some other numbers and they seem really, really wonky. We don't have enough time to go into them because they're huge. Creativity and flow, 
six, 500 to 700% amplified. Motivation goes up a similar level. Learning goes up a similar level. So think about what this means for education, right? There's studies done on college. If we can get through kids through college in three years, the savings and the amount of money that comes into the economy is significant. How do you accelerate learning that way? We know how. Flow will already do it, right? We know that flow massively increases the immune system. It boosts the immune system and it resets the nervous system. Herb Benson at Harvard has said he thinks that flow is responsible for most cases of so-called spontaneous healing. He thinks it's actually the neurobiology of flow that's underneath it. Mm. That may be overstepping the case as mm. far as I'm concerned, but it's still intriguing mm -hmm. and worth pursuing. So healthcare, mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. technology, on and on and mm -hmm. on. What it, what it does is it puts society into hyperdrive, mm -hmm. or at least I think it does. <laughs> I love this. So I want to connect this back to the idea of technology, because you write a lot about technology, and we've bonded around our shared love of new construction kits for our reality. But, you know, okay, so we live during disruptive times. We live during exponential times. Everything is changing. Nobody really understands why until they understand exponential change. Ray Kurzweil from Google explains, we think linearly. Our brains evolved in a linear and local world, but we live in a world now that is exponential. And the best example is 30 linear steps gets you to 30, 30 exponential steps gets you to a billion. Now, what does this mean? It means that the smartphone in your pocket today is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago. It means a young kid in the savannas of Africa with a smartphone has better communications technology than the US president had 25 years ago. So new tools for new realities, new possibilities. Now you co-wrote Abundance, best-selling book with Peter Diamandis. You just released Bold, and now you're releasing Tomorrowland, where science fiction becomes science fact. So talk to me, muse with me a little bit about this idea of these new brain scaffoldings that we're creating and how they're ushering in new possibility spaces for ourselves. And then tell me if you think there's a connection between whether we can leverage these flow states, right? If these new tools require new minds in order to build the future we want to build. It's interesting. Um, the thing that's interesting to me about and the, that I focus on in Tomorrowland is the, is the next step out, right? Yes, we all know that science fiction is becoming science fact, and it, that's kind of everywhere. One random, the random fact of the week, 50% of your body can now be replaced with bionics. Amazing. It's insane. Um, what's really interesting to me about all this stuff is, for example, bionics, right? We, not only do we have bionic limbs for replacement parts and things like that for paraplegics and quadriplegics, but we're starting to get exoskeletons, so strap-on braces. There are now ankle braces and knee braces, bionic ankle braces and knee braces for the elderly, right? And they put energy back into the system. Our brain evolved in such a way that getting old was something that happened, right? There was nothing we could do about it. And the number one complaint about getting old is a loss of mobility. So we're, we now have technology that is taking that away here today, and it's only getting better because, as Jason pointed out, these are all on exponential growth curves. So what's interesting to me about the transformation of science fiction to science fact is less about the whiz-bang technologies and more about the fact that we're starting to fuck with really deep evolutionarily kind of adapted systems, right? We're starting to really poke into what it means to be human at a really, really, really deep level. And it's going to start getting interesting because a lot of the things, it's not even our belief systems, it's the things that our belief systems are built on. It's the substrate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly Well, true. it's like a great line about Edward O. Wilson where he says, we have decommissioned natural selection and now we must look deep within ourselves to decide what we wish to become. I mean, we've already changed the physical, the external world, right? If you look at a city, what is that? Congealed intent, as McKenna would say. Congealed imagination. If you look at the topography of Manhattan, that's shaped more by mind and agency and will and technology than it is by geology. So the mind has already trumped matter in so many ways, but it's like now we're experiencing a recursion, right? Because now we're folding the mind in on itself to start to play with biology itself. So biotechnology, mastering the information processes of biology, rewriting our genome, like having invented the gods we can turn into them, right? And it's, you know, the, the one, I'll give you one example, if we want to talk about really crazy technology. Yes. Mind uploading, right? The idea that we can store ourselves in silicon, upload our brains into computers, and it sounds absolutely crazy, right? Sounds like make-believe. 
people are working on it today, and it's actually a multi-part system and a couple of the parts, like the playback mechanism, we have already. The VR devices that are at Facebook, the next generation of Oculus could play it back. We've already got things that we can implant in the brain that can record basically all the inputs of all your senses. So nobody quite knows what it is that constructs a life, but pretty soon, right, if we go by Ray Kurzweil's numbers, and, and maybe you can and maybe you can't, but his number is by 2045, we'll be able to simulate a brain inside a computer, mm -hmm. which means we'll be able to store ourselves in a computer. So the interesting question to me is, right, how, think about how much blood has been spilled in the past 100 years in the name of religion, right? Think about how much religion uses the threat of the hereafter to steer morality and shape behavior. But what happens to kind of theological morality in the face of technological immortality? And it sounds like a crazy question, but it's a question we're going to actually have to deal with this century. Yeah. I mean, it's no joke. I mean, Larry Page from Google is funding Calico, the California Life Extension Company, right? Craig Venter created the first artificial life form, and when they asked him, are you worried about playing God? He said, who's playing? I mean, there, <laughs> there are legitimately brilliant, smart, <laughs> accomplished people invested in this stuff. And the fact, I mean, it was, what is it, it was um, Freeman Dyson that says in the very near future, a new generation of artists will write genomes with the fluency that Blake and Byron wrote verses. So imagine, so if you think of technology as a conduit to new possibilities, right? New modes of human expression, new modes of human agency. So the technology of the oil painting allowed Van Gogh to emerge. The technology of the musical instrument allowed Beethoven's genius. What are we going to make with biology? Like, what are our artists going to imagineer with the canvas of life. And it sounds crazy, by right. the way, what he's saying sounds crazy, <laughs> but synthetic biology, right, which is essentially treats genetic code like computer code, right, it allows us to write life from scratch. Right now, it's new fuels, new foods, new medicines, but a guy named Andrew Hessel, who's a friend of ours, yeah. who's at Autodesk, he's a distinguished researcher at Autodesk, is literally building a DNA typewriter, meaning it's a user-friendly interface for synthetic biology. So if you imagine what happened to the web, right? We, the web had been around for 20 years. Nobody but computer scientists in the military were using it because there was no way to get on. You had to be a computer scientist who wanted to play. Mark Andreessen comes along in 1993. He creates Mosaic, which becomes Netscape. And we have 26 websites online in 1993, 10,000 the next year, and a million the year after. Andrew is creating a DNA typewriter, which is a user-friendly inter interface for synthetic biology. So this idea that artists are going to be programming life and creating in life is probably five to ten years away longest, right? This is, it's here now. And I have no idea what comes next. I, I don't, what I do think, and I've said this before, you know, it's always been, with, especially with these edge technologies, there's always subculture that drives it forward. And the, there's always, there's a, this, I call it the rebel instinct. Each generation seems the, to out do the next generation. So we did weird hair, and then we did weird clothes, and then we did body piercings and some low-grade tattoos, and then we started doing body modifications, and now we're doing biohacking, right? The cutting edge, people are inserting technology into their body. So I think what we're going to see is the punk rocks of the punk rockers of the future with cat eyes and cat tails and angel right there's already a guy who's tr yeah. Harper's did that story about the guy who's trying to build angel wings that are surgically implanted right this is what's coming so I do think and I think it's going to be a punk rock ethos that kind of drives this yeah. forward yeah. now I want to ask you about this idea of See, I think this stuff is astonishing, right? I mean, I think if you pay attention to what's happening, well, if you pay attention to anything, right? As Darwin used to say, attention of sudden and close graduates into surprise, and this into astonishment, and this into stupefied amazement. And yet most of us don't pay attention to this stuff. Most of us go through our day kind of busy, kind of bored, kind of waiting for the next hit of some kind of ecstasy. But like, I mean, we don't lose sleep over these transformations. We are not in a permanent state of astonishment. Can you tell me about the brain chemistry of why we are walking around half asleep most of the time instead of marveling at these new possibilities that are emerging that are going to fundamentally be changing humanity? Like, why isn't this on the front page of everything every day? I mean, I know you write about this for Forbes. I know you're seeing more and more of it, but it's not everywhere the way it should be. I mean, why isn't everybody talking about this all the time? <laughs> That's Honestly. a real question? Yes! Uh uh, well, I don't know, actually. I wonder that myself. But don't you think that there yeah. is an urgency here, the self-determination of the species being at stake? Like, we should be, like, setting up, like, playgrounds for like, new evolutionary yeah, I mean, paradigms you to know, be if you wanna, experimented with. If you want a biological answer, yeah. it's the amygdala, which is the part of your brain that generates fear. And, you know, it's... So, consciousness explained very, very simply, right? 
the brain takes in a whole lot of information and a whole bunch, and there's a bunch of filters, right? And the filters are, are in front of what is pattern recognition and future prediction. That's all that's going on at a really deep level. Information coming in, grabbed by the senses, bunch of filters, and then we're looking for patterns, and then we're making predictions into the future based on those patterns. That's essentially what your brain is doing at all times. The first filter everything hits is your amygdala, right? It's where all information goes. Why? Because the amygdala governs fight or flight, safety and security, right? So fear is the, it gets up, but it's the first filter anybody puts up, right? It's the very first thing, anything that scares you, right? And all our cognitive biases exist to kind of narrow reality. If you look at what the cognitive biases do, they're information processing shortcuts, right? Bi all biases are like processing shortcuts going wrong because we take in so much information. They've done calculations on average, and if you go by the old numbers, it's 11 million bits of information a second. If you go by the new numbers, it's 400 billion bits of information a second. Whatever the case, it's the what's brain, coming it's what's coming in, yeah. the brain is massively overwhelmed. Your working memory can hold about 40 bits of information at once. That's all you can hold in your head, and you've got 400 billion bits coming in, right? So everything, almost everything that we think of rea as reality is not reality, obviously. It just gets thrown out, and the first thing that's throwing it out is anything you're scared of. So. Why is this not on the front page? Because all this stuff is scary, right? On a, I mean, it can go horribly wrong. We were talking up about what great was synthetic biology and what artists are going to produce. I wrote an article for The Atlantic not too long about uh, long ago about customizable bioweapons that can target individual people, meaning I could now assassinate the president using synthetic biology, and he's going to think he got a cold. And it's only targeting the president, and it's doable today. Right, so we'll see. But see, we'll see, but see that fast. that does get very scary fast. But when you know the the answer, yes. But the answer that I found Kurzweil has given that I found very compelling is he said, well, that's always been the case. Technology has always been a double-edged sword. I mean, fire can cook our foods or burn our enemies. Perhaps the most powerful information technology that's ever been created is the alphabet, and the alphabet can be used to compose beautiful Shakespearean sonnets that you know expand our interior world. But the alphabet can also be used to move people to kill each other and kill the other and so on and so forth. So it's like these tools extend our will, but they can extend our will in any direction. You know, so yes, it's up to us to make sure we use these things wisely, but that's just kind of, that's always been the case. I mean, we haven't destroyed ourselves thus far, so I think we have a pretty good track record. Also, if you look at the work of Steven Pinker, he says the world is beginning less violent for the last couple of decades. The world is less violent now than it's ever been, contrary to the doom and gloom things we see in the media. So do you think that there is hope that in spite of these new tools being more dangerous, we somehow will have the conscience to not destroy ourselves? I don't know if we're not going to destroy ourselves. I will like to pull it back to flow states. One of the things that we know about flow, um, and it, a lot of this has to do with all the neurochemicals that show up in flow, besides all the performance enhancement and their addictive nature, they're all social bonding chemicals, right? So if flow is one of these technologies that's going to drive us into the future, all of the social bonding chemicals, all the norepinephrine and dopamine which show up in flow, that's romantic love. Right, endorphins. Those that's maternal love. Anandamide is that same kind of psychoactive chemical that's in marijuana. It makes you open to new ideas and love we your love friends. That. And right, so these are really potent social bonding chemicals. The point is that flow expands empathy, and a lot of these new technologies seem to be able to play with that. Right, we can expand empathy. You were talking about the difference between states and stages, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I, when you start talking about empathy, I get excited because there's that. Great line from, uh, from Interstellar that talked about how empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. And one of the things that our new technologies do is extend our line of sight. I mean, if you think virtual reality, that potentially is an engine of empathy. You put somebody inside of a virtual space, place them in a Syrian refugee camp, you extend their empathy, a lot more difficult to ignore. So you think the combination of these external technology and potentially these flow states and this internal technologies could allow us to create a more empathetic species, could actually create a shift that scales? Look at the, uh, you gotta, I mean, you know, I, I disagree with the interstellar line, okay. for example, because what religion is, basically, is a way to extend empathy beyond clan and kin. That's what it was, right? It was, if you go back 500 years, mm -hmm. if I wasn't related to you, if you didn't live in my village, you were other and I wanted to fight you and kill you, right? Religion allowed us to extend that. Suddenly, oh wow, he's a Christian, I'm a Christian. Okay, we don't have to kill each other, right? Mm -hmm. So we've seen what these, you know, we've also seen them backfire, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. but we've seen technology, right, language massively extend empathy before. 
this is a much more kind of visceral version of it, okay. right? Okay. I mean, I don't think it's everybody on ecstasy, but you know, it's it, it definitely opens you up, and you're you know you're closer to it. So I mean, I th I think there's a lot of hope, yeah. but I also think the thing about technology, exponential technology, at this point is it does put the power of God into the hands of individuals, right? And that's what's different today. Promethean, stealing Perfect. fire from the gods. Well. Is uh, Tease the name of your next book? Stealing Fire. <laughs> okay. So it was originally, you know, you, we, we had a whole conversation about this idea of mapping the highest possible states of human consciousness, mapping our ecstasies, creating a kind of cartography of ecstatic states. And so can you talk a little bit about Stealing Fire, flow states, and how these emerging technologies are allowing us to basically <laughs> to get higher than we've ever gotten, to explore new spaces of ecstatic rapture, the neurobiology of mystical experience, and so on and so forth, like hacking nirvana, right? Beyond flow, hacking nirvana. Well, the inter I mean, the, the, so the idea th that Jason's talking about a book that I'm writing now with my, my partner in the Flow Genome Project, Jamie Wheel, and it's called Stealing Fire, and the, the core idea is there's, there's a whole swatch of experiences, psychedelic experiences, drug experiences, flow states, so-called mystical experiences, et cetera, et cetera, and when you start adding them together and looking at them. First of all, what you find is from a neurobiological perspective, very, very, very similar. For example, meditative states and flow. In flow, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex goes off. We talked about that. But another portion of your brain called the medial orbital prefrontal cortex, which is creative self-expression, goes crazy, becomes really hyperactive because flow, creativity goes th through the roof. This portion of the brain gets really hyperactive. In meditative states, because you don't need creative decision making, that portion of the brain shuts off, right? Other things turn off. When you look at it, it's basically a set of kind of knobs and levers. We're turning down certain things, we're turning up certain things, we're turning on certain things, turning off, but it's a set category. And what we're discovering really in the past hundred years and much more in the past 25 years is there's, um, I call it an upper possibility space of human experience that has almost been completely off the map. And by upper, I mean north of happiness. Things start at happiness right. and they get weird, right? right? But there's a whole huge space up there that we haven't inhabited. And when people kind of tripped into it, we thought they were crazy. We burned them at stakes for a long time. Or then they were, or we called them drug addicts. And right. we wrote them off and banished them and whatever. All this stuff is being opened up. And more interestingly, it's being opened up technologically. And it seems like when things get opened up technologically, we're less afraid of them, right? Michael Persinger creates the God helmet. He can, he basically puts it on, it sh shoots, Magnetic f electromagnetic fields into your right temporal lobe. We know right temporal lobe epilepsy. When you, this part of the brain gets excited, we have out-of-body experiences. We have near-death experiences. We have, we, by the way, the same part of your brain gets very excited in dreaming. So we have this experience every night. But we can now stimulate this with technology. It doesn't work all the time. It doesn't work for everybody. But we're getting better and better at it. And people are, you know, we might be hesitant about taking a drug or we write it off, but if it's technologically mediated, we're a lot more comfortable with it. It's allowing it. to us to yeah. op kind of open up this really crazy space that we don't really understand. Yeah, well, I mean, it captures my imagination, especially when you say north of happiness, right? Because, I mean, what is the self-help movement, the happiness movement, billion-dollar industries, people trying to figure out new metrics for happiness because it turns out that getting everything you want is not going to make you happy and that experiences, for example, are more valuable than things when it comes to longer form satisfaction and satiation. But, you know, we are an existential species. We are an agitated species. You know, we, with our minds, we can ponder the in infinite. Now I'm channeling Ernest Becker. We can ponder <laughs> the infinite, yet we're housed in heart pumping, breath gasping, decaying bodies. So our greatest ecstasies are haunted, right? Are shadowed by the fact that they are temporary, that we are finite, no matter how many times we get the goosebumps and are moved to tears by beautiful art or beautiful ecstasy or beautiful rhapsody. So my question for you, when you're talking about north of happiness, technological mediation, um, I'm reminded of David Pierce's work, The Hedonistic Imperative. You familiar with David Pierce? Mm -hmm. So he's a trans transhumanist philosopher that believes that we are going to institute a kind of paradise engineering, as he calls it, where we're going to be using new biotechnologies and nanotechnologies to shift our hedonic treadmill and to literally neuroengineer gradients of bliss that will make even our greatest ecstasies today pale. He calls them our, pre our Darwinian old school ecstasies compared to what we're going to create. Where do you stand on that idea, not just in terms of the science, but in terms of the, the poet in you? Does this excite you? 
this idea of like creating spaces so much more north of happy and what that's going to be like? I'm interested. I'm interested. I mean, what I'm, you know, so we have something called a hedonic set point. A hedonic right. set point basically means that somewhere between ages six and 12, the amount of happiness and sadness you're going to feel in life is pretty much set. It's why you feel the same emotionally at 10, at 20, at 30, at 40. It's roughly the same bandwidth of emotion. It's because we have these things called emotional set points and they get locked down, right? What I'm less, I'm less interested in this super ecstatic. I mean, I just think that's, it's interesting, but it's, it's very bizarre and I have no idea what comes from that. But what happens if we can just shift everybody and we're 3% happier right. that that and that's really really possible for example we know massive amounts of research back this up that the people who have the most flow in their lives it's often said that people with the most flow in their lives are the happiest people on earth and it's right. actually a misnomer happiness is a temporary condition and people with the most flow in their lives score off the charts on life satisfaction and well-being tests so it's meaning and it's overall possibility it's not this beyond happiness right it's beyond happiness and so we know flow, repeated exposure to flow, can shift your emotional set point. It's one of the only things that can actually shift this, right? So that's where it starts to get interesting because we know this is possible. We know this is doable. So what happens if we move an entire society a couple degrees up that ladder? That's interesting to me. That's a happy place to be. Well, it means, I mean, it means a whole lot less fear. Right. So that first filter we were talking about gets damped down. And then the possibility space gets really interesting. Wow. Gets me very happy, bro. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> um, so, can we talk a little bit about um, your work? I mean, you, you, people say the people who live in their flow state kind of build their whole lives around it. Now, you live in a dog sanctuary that you created, which I think is one of the most amazing things ever because you're this like amazingly gifted writer writing all these New York bestsellers, but you live with like all these dogs. T can you tell me a little bit about what you discovered about animals and how that gets you into your flow state? A little bit. Well, a, c a couple of things. So I'm kind of in awe of that aspect of your life. I run an animal sanctuary called Rancho de Chihuahua, and we would deal with hospice care and special needs care for really sick small dogs. And um, really, really sick. Most of our animals show up to us. They come directly from vets often with like a month to live, two months to live, that kind of thing. Flow is at the heart of our healing methodology. And as I said earlier, it boosts the immune system. It resets the immune system. Our animals live for a really long time, right? So we, we actually do put these, I mean, we were talking about is flow trainable. We put our dogs in the flow all the time. It's, re it's really, it's actually not hard. Um, uh, and we, by the way, we don't know if it's all animals that are hardwired for flow. We know it's dogs and we know some, it, at some point down the mammalian chain, it probably cuts off and we don't know where, um, but we absolutely know dogs can get into flow. Uh, what else do you want me to talk about? No, no, that, I just wanted you to talk about that. But I also want to bring up the subject just because usually when I'm in a flow state, I'm usually very quickly marveling at something because I'm a very curious person. So I'm always like, I want to get into a flow state and see a movie. I want to get into a flow state and go for a walk in some beautiful spot, maybe like Big Sur or whatever. And there was this, uh, there was this great book by Alison Griffiths called Shivers Down Your Spine. It talked about cinema, gothic cathedrals, and the immersive view. And so she was talking about external technologies that we use to trigger these states of rapture states of awe. And she said, you know, gothic cathedrals are designed in a certain way to put you in touch with the sublime, to kind of hack your brain and put you in awe right away. The modern incarnation of that, the IMAX theater. Sure. She says you go into an IMAX theater and right off the bat, the space is already doing something to your, to your perception. It's already doing something to your mood. And there's been a lot of recent science about this emotion of awe that it turns out that experiences that stretch your perceptual boundaries force you to create new maps of the world. And in assimilating these new experiences, you experience this kind of cognitive ecstasy, this awe. And after the moment passes, you're left with increased feelings, residual feelings of heightened creativity, heightened well-being, heightened satisfaction, which is al already wonderful. And additionally, these experiences of awe are anti-inflammatory. So they're also good for you. So what is your take on this side emotion of awe and, so and where it fits in with what, flow? Yeah, what we know about awe actually is so one of the triggers for flow, one of the things that will drive us into flow is, is what's technically called a rich environment, which is a fancy way of saying lots of novelty, lots of complexity, lots of unpredictability. Complexity is what triggers awe. So when you stare up at the night sky and you see a billion galaxies, right, and you cannot process it, 
your conscious mind literally cannot process it. So in, what happens in flow is we trade conscious processing for subconscious processing. Flow is the only time we actually get to watch the subconscious mind work. And the reason it's such a weird state, conscious thought travels about 150 miles an hour. Subconscious thought, 2,000 to 5,000 miles an hour. So it's like, you know, it's hyperspeed decision making. Awe is the front edge of a flow state. So when you look up at the night sky and you sucked in and time dilation, everything freezes for a second, that's actually the front end of the flow state. And like, so we know from, this is Teresa Mobley's work at Harvard, she figured out that the heightened creativity that shows up in flow actually outlasts the flow state by a day, by two days. It suggests, and this is really incredible, so f one thing we know, um, and the best example of this is something called the Red Bull Creativity Project. Red Bull, the energy drink company, um, teamed up with MIT and TED, and they did the largest study of creativity ever done, right? They looked at everything. They learned two things. One, creativity is fundamental to society, big surprise. Two, we can't teach anybody how to be creative, more creative. We suck at it. So what Teresa Mobley discovered at Harvard is flow actually trains the brain up to be more creative over the long haul, right? It extends for a couple of days, right? What we're seeing in awe is it extending for a couple of hours. It's a small scale flow state, God, basically, okay. right? Wonderful. Well, we got like five more minutes for the official talk portion, and then uh, we'd love to open it up to questions from you guys. So if you want to start thinking about some questions, um, do you have a question? I, I want to actually turn the question yeah. you asked me okay. back on yeah. you, yeah. which is, because you've been thinking about this a lot and talking about this a lot, but what do you think this means? I mean, if we can start producing these states, if we can start opening up this so-called ecstatic space, and by the way, if we use the word ecstasy, right? I'm not talking about the club drug. I'm talking about the root, the Greek root for ecstasy is ecstasis. It means to get out of your head. Yeah. And just be beside ourselves. To be beside ourselves. And just by the way, we did a research study at the Flow Genome Project. We wanted to see how much money people spend getting out of their heads. So we basically added up all the things people do to get out of their heads. The number, and this was the most, we did it in the most conservative possible way we could have done the math. It's $10 trillion a year. One sixth of the global economy is what we spend getting out of our heads and getting out of ourselves. That's what the we spend. The altered states economy, the right? The altered states economy, exactly. It's one sixth of the global economy. Yeah, which I think is wonderful because when we get out of our heads, I mean, not to bring up like psychedelic language, but we dissolve boundaries. We dissolve boundaries of thought. We dissolve patterns in our thinking. We see the world in a new way. We get something akin to the astronaut overview effect. We see the gestalt from a different angle. So I feel like it makes us less rigid people, more compassionate people, more tolerant people. I mean, only good comes from getting out of our heads, I find. You know, I find it to be a wonderfully ro romantic release, you know, to get rid of yourself for a little while, you know, and to find that there's something there afterwards. I think the only problem with it is it's, it's massively addictive, right? You can, you know, yes. pretty easily go down the rabbit hole of I want my brain to be turned off all the time and you yeah. don't come back. But what about, like, taking lessons from that other space and then having integration? You know, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of stuff in the, in the literature now, in the science, in the news, about psychedelic psychotherapy, right? So giving PTSD patients some MDMA and compressing 10 years of normal psychotherapy into six hours, you know, yeah, the I, kind I, of ontological shift that can be triggered by these technologies of inner space and what that can lead us to. I mean, Michael Pollan's article in The New Yorker recently was saying maybe what we can do is not just talk about how we can help people that are pathologically suffering from PTSD, but what about taking those insights and applying them for people that are okay? So making well people better. Could we use psychedelic therapies for people that would identify as not being trauma, not tra traumatized? Well, that was, you know? I mean, that, you know, if you go back to, psych I don't know what you guys know about psychedelic research, but before Nixon shut it all down, thousands of studies were done. Right. And most of them, a lot of them were done on addiction. Psychedelics turn out to be very, very good for fighting addiction. But they're also, most of them were done on creativity, right? Which is why Steve Jobs said LSD right. is one of the three great things I've done in my life. I think you have to be fairly repressed for LSD to be that great of an experience for you, but okay, whatever, I'm not, you know, it's Steve Jobs for you, yeah. <laughs> he was. Um, but you know, I, it, it definitely opens up a whole new level of possibility. If you t I mean, if you go back, you, you mentioned the, the PTSD uh, MDMA studies. If you guys actually look at those studies, they're astounding, they, they, they looked at, uh, war veterans, so Iraq and Afghanistan, people with really serious sec uh, PTSD, and they looked at sexual trauma victims and child abuse victims, and they were finding that they could overwrite the PTSD in one to two sessions. So one, so 20 years of therapy doesn't work, all the drugs we got on the market doesn't, don't work, but two MDMA sessions seem to work really fast. There you go, no surprise there, actually. 
Um, cool, guys. Well, we'd love to turn it over to some questions from you. This has been really fun, but I feel like you guys could probably catalyze some uh, offshoot conversation. Uh, two questions. Um, the first was when you were talking about flow and you said um, we have this interesting opportunity to study extreme sports and the ones that are really flowing are the ones that are successful and yet the ones that aren't flowing go you know, to the hospital or die. Um, but you said like when you're in flow you can have higher risk taking. So is it possible that they're in flow but they just are risky and therefore they have an accident? <laughs> Certainly, you have that. Uh, Scott Schmidt, who's uh, one of the, kind of one of the early extreme skiers, um, said flow makes you feel like Superman up until the moment you're not, which is which is very very true, right? Um, and you know, certainly in the shit happens category, stuff happens, right? You can be in a flow state, you can be flying down the hill on a mountain bike and hit a rock, and it's all, and you know, you put yourself in the hospital. I broke 84 bones that way, um, <laughs> literally. <laughs> um, but. Uh, so yes, there, there is some of that. And risk taking definitely goes up and flow. There's a study that just actually came out of Germany that showed that um, people, you know, every time, because you need, risk is one of the things that focuses attention, it drives you into flow. It's a really great flow trigger. And it also drives dopamine in the brain, which is a focusing chemical among everything else it does. So it's, all this stuff is really great to drive you into flow, but over your lifetime, it, you're absolutely, you will take greater and greater risks and greater and greater risks and greater and greater risks. Um, so that will definitely happen. Um, as far, usually what happens with the younger uh, action sport athletes is they have Kodak courage. They're getting by on kind of youth and balls and adrenaline, and it will only get you so far. Usually what happens with flow, because um, it's, it's a much calmer space, people tend to make better decisions as a general rule. I mean, you, you obviously can still kill yourself in, in flow states, um, but as a general rule, people make better decisions. Better informed risk if they were to take the risk. risk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my second question was: um, I just spent the weekend in an Art of Dying conference, and wow. they do use psilocybin to ease anxiety at the end of life. So, in terms of um, the flow or training people with flow, do you think that it would limit the fear of death? And also, is it possible to be in the flow in later years? I mean, obviously, you can die at any age, but as, is there any like Yeah, there's no age. So what, what we know about flow is it's ubiquitous. It shows up in anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. So there's no age limits on flow whatsoever. We also know what, so what psilocybin does, right, is it creates a sense of oneness with everything. Where that sense comes from, actually, is transient hypofrontality. So there's a part of your brain, the right parietal lobe, that is what separates, it generates sort of a barrier between self and other. So it's so it exists so I can walk around this room and not bump into furniture. So if I have a stroke or brain damage to this part of my brain, I can't sit down on a couch because I don't know where my leg ends and the couch begins. So during intense concentration like shows up in meditation or flow or things like this, part of the brain shuts down and we can no longer separate self from other. And at that point, you're convinced because there's no other data available that you are one with everything. The same thing is going on if you're using psilocybin or LSD, it's the same mechanism. It doesn't all the roads lead to Rome? It doesn't matter how you get in. So, in terms of using flow to kind of combat end of life anxiety, absolutely, absolutely, it would work very, very well. It might be interesting to couple it with psilocybin or some of those other therapies. Right, because the the people that are doing the research in this, um, you know, it's not like the psilocybin is giving you anything. What it is is it's activating what you already. Are capable of so. Well, I think what what Rich Doyle says is that psychedelics are they don't really have an effect per se, but they're non-specific amplifiers of consciousness. So what really sculpts the psychedelic trip is your set and your setting. So the setting is the place that you've pre-configured, that you've architected where the trip is going to unfold, and of course the set is what you're bringing to that. Your sort of predispositions, your fears, your anxieties, your intention, what you want to resolve, what you want to uh, probe and explore, and. What, what you come to perceive in those moments, according to the work of Rich Doyle, who, who I adore, is that you come to perceive, first of all, the feedback loops between your creative and linguistic choices and your consciousness. In other words, once the trip starts, you realize just how much where you are is determining your subjecti subje subjective experience. If you're in a mystical, beautiful park in Big Sur, you start to feel mystical, beautiful sensations. But you're feeling those already unconsciously just by being there. 
But the trip in amplifying and bringing forth that subconscious feeling, all of a sudden the theater of the moment is informed by the stage that you're in. So if you're in that beautiful place, it's already coloring the trip towards beautiful spaces. If you pre-configure music, I mean, there's an article by Timothy Leary written in the 60s called Programming the Psychedelic Experience, which was all about the idea that if you could successfully pattern and pre-configure the input signals that were coming in when a person is in a highly suggestible psychedelic state, you could script the journey. You could literally outline and steer awareness and subjectivity so you could create your own compressed version of a Joseph Campbell hero's journey. You could take the psilocybin, depart from the ordinary, go down the rabbit hole, learn new things about yourself, see the world in a new way, have cathartic realizations and make the return, right? And holy moly, like talk about compressing a journey into a journey. But I mean, I think this is really fascinating. You can tell I'm very passionate about Jason this. Jason Silva, ladies and gentlemen. No, no, but, <laughs> but, but there's a lot to do here. But really, the, the key idea is that consciousness is a collaborative act between subject and object. And it becomes even more so a collaborative act between subject and object when you are in a psychedelically adult state. You realize that mind, that awareness, is a co-production between self and world. It's all about these feedback loops that you just come to witness and you come to see. So that can either be a frightening bummer if you're in the wrong set and setting, or it can be nirvana in the right set and setting. Right? What Jason said. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> okay, we got a couple more minutes. Any, yes? So, is there any way that those really negative feelings that you associate with the frontal lobe can actually stimulate a state of flow? Because I had a moment of terrible fear and anxiety, like crippling, and I gave the best talk of my life. Oh, yeah. And then the next week, I was really meditative and I gave a really boring talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, so, I said earlier there's a flow cycle. The first part of the cycle is known as struggle, and it is your prefrontal cortex may go away in flow. This is all prefrontal cortex, right? Struggle is called struggle for a reason. It is really unpleasant. It is a learning phase. It is a loading phase. You are loading and overloading the brain with information, right? I find, um, I often found, you know, when I was a, I, I made my living as a journalist for 20, 25 years, and I always found the best stories kind of, I wanted a flow state experience, but I would find that I had to be really, like the trip had to scare me, the journey had to scare me, that night before I wasn't sleeping for weeks because I was going off to the Himalayas to go chase whatever. You know, I would really work myself into a state, um, a really negative state, so that even a little bit of a positive experience could kick me into flow. It didn't take much at that point because I had freaked myself out so much ahead of time. So yeah, I mean, I ju ju you know, both Jason and myself will tell you we're both flow junkies and we're both totally neurotic. And a lot, you know, a lot of the reasons I, I think I got into this is because it's bad up here, right. right? If I, right, I got to do a lot to get out of here um, under normal conditions. I agree. <laughs> Very neurotic. <laughs> and not only that, but I'm obsessed with Ernest Becker who wrote the book, The Denial of Death, because I'm extremely haunted by the idea of transience and mortality. And I can vouch for the fact that when I'm in a flow state, it's the only time when bliss rules. There's no thoughts about, oh, this is all going to end one day, so why even be excited because it's all temporary anyway and everything dissolves into nothing. Ah. But when I'm in a flow state and I'm watching an amazing movie or I'm listening to beautiful music or I'm being blown away by the ideas that somebody's sharing, holy shit, I'm in the eternal now and death doesn't exist. So, Yeah, um, I'm curious, uh, how are these flow states? You talk about extreme sports. I've been a surfer for 30 years. In the last 10 years, the shit that's been happening you can't even believe it. And I, is it epigenetics through YouTube? Or is, I mean, people are getting these flow states and you see somebody do something. It's like that Learn Hamilton photo when he, that came on a surfer magazine. I mean, literally just everybody was, what the hell? And five years later, everybody's doing it. And I see it over and over again and it just fascinates me. That was one of the, I mean, one of the reasons I, I, I got interested in this field is my, from my early career as a journalist, I chased action sport athletes around mountains for five, six years. And I obviously am not an action sport athlete, so I broke a lot of bones along the way. And I would have these like year-long injuries, right, where I had 65 hairline fractures in my leg and I didn't move for a year. And I would come back to the sport like a year later and it was like 30 years of evolution in a year. And my first question was, what the hell's going on? How is this even possible? So. What, it actually, what actually happened in action sports, a lot of it was, so creativity is a flow trigger. It, creativity is amplified by flow, but 
the actual pattern recognition, when you link ideas together, you get a tiny squirt of dopamine. We've all had this experience. You've done a crossword puzzle. You get an answer right, that little rush of pleasure you get afterwards, that's dopamine. Dopamine also tunes signal to noise ratios, meaning it allows us to see more patterns. So the reason you get it one crossword answer, answer right and then you get a couple in a row right, it's because dopamine is helping you see more patterns. Creativity, and it happened because of snowboarding. Snowboarding was a banned sport. So people started hiking their snowboards to the top of the mountains. If you're hiking your snowboard to the top of a mountain, you don't want to be the fastest person at the bottom because you just spent four hours getting to the top, and that's stupid. So instead, it became the most creative way down is the winner, right? And there's not just one winner. Everybody can win, right? So this was adopted. Free, it was free riding and snowboarding. It became free, ride, free skiing and free surfing and on and on and on. And it became about creativity. And that, in combination with the risk and the other factors, just started driving so much flow. But the other thing that happened in 1986, we invented the VCR. And it sounds really funny, but try to learn a dynamic action sports move from a static magazine photo, right? It sucks. It's really hard to do. But with the invention of the VCR, by 1986, the VCR had, I think it was 50% of American homes had a VCR in it by that point. And suddenly, especially for skaters, they were the first to notice it. You could pause and rewind, and it became this training manual, right? So technology coupled with flow kind of created this massive feedback loop that led us yeah, to where we are today. To, to grow up the magazines, and I had a moment, a pivotal moment, where I was trying to learn how to do an off the lip when I was young, and off the lip to go to the top of the wave. And I saw so many pictures, and I would hit and I would stop. And a friend said, "You're stopping with the picture. The picture is it flows all the way." That's awesome. You, and I was like, going with the that's picture. "That's pretty funny." And then you know, five years later, everybody you know learning it through the whole the whole motion, but we didn't have that. Yet. That's funny. Yeah, I was I was talking to uh, Ian Walsh another great surfer, and he was talking about this, and he says by the time he goes home, he lives 10 minutes from Jaws, but by the time he's home from Jaws, somebody has uploaded the footage of his session onto YouTube, and he can start doing video playback review as soon as he gets home because of where the technology is, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Are either of you, or during out this, this talk, were either of you in a flow state, and if so, how'd you get there? And if not, why not? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we both do a lot of speaking, like all the time, and, and I was talking to him about this earlier. Sometimes the focusing that happens when you are in front of people, right, which means I don't feel entitled to people's time at all. So my brain right off the bat is getting really focused and making sure that whatever it's doing up here is going to be useful information. There's not a lot of ums or buts or taking my time when I talk because I don't feel entitled to time. So I get really focused, right? And then there's that space where knowledge and skill set meets opportunity. It's not easy, but it's not too hard that I get overwhelmed. It's just enough that I'm in a happy place where I'm like really focused, but I can handle this. And yes, there are moments when I go into deep flow. Yeah. What about you? Sometimes. But, you know, interestingly, when, when it, we train people up in flow. Obviously, risk is important. I talk a lot about action sport athletes, and everybody's always like, oh, but I don't want to take physical risks to get into flow. That sucks. I don't want to break bones and whatever. And I say, well, great news. You don't need physical risk. You can replace it with emotional risk, intellectual risk, or social risk. And the cool thing is, social risk, your brain can't tell the difference between physical danger and social danger. They're processed in the exact same structures, which is why fear of public speaking is the number one fear in the world and not, say, getting eaten by a grizzly bear. You would think from an evolutionary perspective, right, getting eaten by a grizzly bear is something scarier, but no, it's public speaking and the reason is, if you go back 300 years and you screwed up socially, Shame. you got kicked out, kicked out of the tribe. Exile, banished was a capital punishment. So the brain can't tell the difference between social fear and physical fear. So being on stage, even if you do it a lot, it definitely focuses you a lot, right? And I think Jason's right. I don't feel entitled to anybody's time, so I don't want to bore you guys. <laughs> you know, so that helps drive attention as more. As well, in the back. Hi. Um, you mentioned, Jason, the eternal now, which is uh, you know, something, a term that's obviously connected sometimes to spirituality and mysticism, and yeah. I think you touch on that lightly. 
can you guys talk a little bit more about any correlations of spirituality and mysticism, if at all, in your research with the states of flow? Oh, he, he definitely can. You know about the neuro neurobiology of mystical experience. It's a chapter in your new book, right? Yeah, there's a chapter in, in Tomorrowland on it. So when, earlier when I was talking about kind of knobs and levers in the brain, we have a... I'm not saying that we there's no mystery, and I'm and just be I personally am an atheist, but just because I can tell you how the neurobiology of spiritual experience works, all that means is these experiences are mediated in the brain. So I'm not if you're spiritually inclined, if you're religious, I am not what I'm talking about does not disavow what you believe. It just says these experiences are mediated through the brain. But we now know that flow states, so-called mystical experiences, psychedelic experiences, these are all the same structures in the brain. And we're getting really kind of good at figuring out where they are and how to precipitate them. Where I think that's interesting is I think we're at the very front edge of this, right? I think, you know, for years and years and years, if you go by kind of what the Buddhist meditators have told us, that these things go out and on forever. There's layer after layer after layer. I think we're at the front edge edge of kind of decoding that stuff, I'm really interested to what happens as we get deeper and deeper. Because there are weird questions, even in flow, we were talking about this earlier, you have access to really high quality information. 90% of it makes sense. 90% of it, you're like, okay, I get where this comes from. 10% of it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it, it really feels magical. And it, you know, there's not an easy way to explain it away. I certainly love an explanation for it, and I think poking deeper into these realms, especially into the science of these realms, is going to get us there. But open questions. I think this will be our last question, and then we'll just do a little chit chat. But yeah. You had you had talked about seventeen ways to get into a flow state, um, which has been like. Okay, so if you go to stephenkotler.com, K-O-T-L-E-R, right, is how you spell my last name. If you Type in your email, you'll get a free PDF uh, for flow and performance, and it breaks down all 17 of those triggers and a little bit of the flow cycle and tell you how to apply them. But you can finish asking your question. <laughs> you know, you had focused primarily on risk in action sports and so forth. So I'm just wondering what are like sort of like the other really important ones that you would, you know, argue. I would say one of them is cannabis. <laughs> and That's especially the now the ubiquity, the ubiquity of, of medical marijuana, turning points. Uh, there's actually a lot of literature I found online about weed and flow states. I mean, certainly Carl Sagan, I think, would agree. A lot of jazz musicians would agree. Um, He's not wrong. I mean, if you, the, you want the cheapest flow hack in the world, 20-minute run, cup of coffee, marijuana. That order. It reproduces. the. It's the exact same neurochemical cocktail as flow. Simple. But... I'll go with the classic. The other, or just no, you got it. The, you need the you you have you want to you want to exercise to the point that the voice in your head is gone, and that's it. Like so, as soon as the like go for a long walk, and when the voice in your head sort of quiets down, drink a cup of coffee, smoke a joint. That order. There you go. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. It is the truth. Um, but uh, so let me to answer your question. The uh, the most famous of flows of, of all flows triggers is what's known as the challenge skills balance. So the idea here, and you alluded to it a second ago, is we pay most attention, right? So every one of these flow triggers are literally just ways of driving attention into the now. Flow follows focus, right? So all these triggers are basically the 17 triggers that we know of that the 17 things evolution shaped your brain to pay the most attention to, right? So one of them is called the challenge skills balance. And it means I pay the most attention to the task at hand when the task at hand is, makes me stretch but not snap, right? So you want, you want something that's difficult, it's beyond your skill set, but not too difficult that it's starting to generate massive amounts of fear. It's a tricky balance to find. For example, underperformers don't like it because to hit this sweet spot, it's usually the point you start to get really uncomfortable. There's no way around it, right? You're beyond your comfort zone, literally. But for overachievers, they screw up because overachievers, we, so a guy named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is often called the godfather of flow. He's a University of Chicago psychologist. Uh, and a Google mathematician sat down and they tried to figure out what is the exact challenge skills ratio. And the number, the gradient difference they came up with back of the envelope calculation, this is not a real number. This is not real science. It's pretend science. But the number was 4%. So a 4% difference between challenge and skills. What happens with really real high performers 
is will blow by 4% without even noticing. You'll take on a challenge that 10% greater, 20% greater, 30% greater, generates so much fear, you will block yourself from a flow state. So we pay the most attention to those things where we stretch but don't snap. They call it the flow channel. What it basically means is if there's not enough stimulation, you're bored, you're not paying a whole lot of attention. Too much stimulation, there's anxiety, and it'll kick you out. In between is this sweet spot, this flow channel, and that can be applied anywhere, obviously. Sports, creativity, writing, whatever. In my writing, I always know I'm gonna write, so I, I tend to believe that, for me at least, other people will argue with me, I guess, but for me, the best writing is just really honest, right? I want to tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. I always know that I'm in that sweet spot when I, there's, I'm a little nervous to publish something because I've been a little too vulnerable. That's how I kind of know that I've been in that sweet spot while I was writing. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, uh, I think we're going to end the formal discussion, but we're going to mingle here for a little while. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, guys. You just take physical fitness out of the kind of beach muscles, cosmetic and aesthetic, and you turn it into athletic and, and neurokinetic, right? So you've just completely just rebooted physical culture. And actually, it's more of a throwback to like 19th century Germany and the gymnasium effects, which is a throwback to Plato and the original academy and Pythagoras and that.